Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Echo Diabetes in the Time of COVID. I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, Pediatric Endocrinologist and um, Director of this program. I wanna start by uh, acknowledging and thanking uh, the un unrestricted educational grants that we received from Nova Nordis and Pfizer Inc. that make this program possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients with type one and type two diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment and management in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have access to routine specialty care. Even before COVID-19 pandem the pandemic, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal. Data from over 190 million people enrolled in health plans that report HEDIS to the National Committee of Quality Assurance illustrate that system failure for patients with diabetes. In 2018, less than one third of patients with type one and type two diabetes had A1C within target range. And even more concerning, 30 to 40% of patients had A1C values greater than 9%. We must recognize that these outcomes do not reflect non-compliance of patients, but rather system failure. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes patient risks and vulnerability to infections and complications, including COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are able to achieve glycemic targets. We are living in unprecedented times with COVID-19, but systemic racism and health inequalities have been endemic to the U.S. prior to COVID. However, COVID is making these injustices more clear. We must come together as a medical community and change our practice. We must act. When the mortality rate from COVID in Black Americans is at least two times, if not five times, as high as mortality from, from whites, we must act. When marked racial disparities in diabetes management exist, and prior to COVID-19, we must act. When Black Americans with diabetes with equivalent socioeconomic status as white Americans are less likely to be prescribed intensive insulin management regimens and technology demonstrate to improve diabetes outcomes, we must act. We must act and recognize systemic racism and implicit bias that, that are also occurring within our medical community and practices today. Our leadership team and faculty are committed to promoting health equity from our program and combating systemic racism in the US. We are committed to act, action. While we had expected health disparities to be a theme throughout the series, we have an upcoming didactic session on diabetes disparities on July 22nd that will be presented by our faculty member, Dr. Ashby Walker, medical sociologist and my colleague who directs the Echo Diabetes and the Health Equity Initiative at the University of Florida Diabetes Institute. In the meantime, on behalf of the Echo Diabetes team, I encourage you to start to act to address systemic racism and implicit bias in your practices. Here at Stanford, we're partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the U.S. on this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized hub-and-spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities and improve health out outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Zoom-based clinics led by multidisciplinary faculty from academic medical centers and community organizations provide providers with education, case-based learning, and expertise that they need to treat patients within their own community. Our presentation agenda will be a lecture followed by a submitted case presentation from the community, and then we will address some of the pre-submitted questions and audience uh, members during the activity. Please use the Q&A feature to submit questions specific to the topic of the presentation. Please use the chat box um, for recommending resources to the community. This webinar is being recorded and the lecture portion of this webinar will be available in a week on our website. The case presentation from today will not be included on the web, uh, on-demand webinar. Our web development team is working to build a resource library on COVID-19 uh, where the session materials will be found. After the webinar ends, you'll be emailed an evaluation that will enable you to claim continuing education credits. We have an exciting series yet to come with excellent and relevant topics. As a reminder, you and other learners are welcome to drop in for any one of these sessions. Uh, next week, uh, the didactic will be on insulin dosing and therapeutic inertia in the time of COVID. 
We are fortunate to have a national faculty team from over 12 ECHO programs and organizations around the country. I would now like to introduce them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to start um, with our team um, at Stanford. Um, once again, I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, pediatric endocrinologist and uh, director of Project ECHO Diabetes. Uh, Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Baer, and I am the director for uh, education for this program and the director of education and research for ECHO Diabetes. I've also had diabetes for 49 years. And Marissa? Hi, I'm Marissa Town, and I am a nurse and a diabetes educator at Stanford. I'm the program manager for this program, and I've had diabetes for 30 years. Christine? All right, and we'll move on to our faculty, Marina. Um, I'm Marina Vestina. I'm the adult endocrinology here at Stanford. Thank you so much. And Magdalena. Hi, I'm, I'm Magdalena Ford. I'm a nurse practitioner with Stanford's adult endocrinology clinic. And Corey. Hi there, uh, Corey, I'm a psychologist on the um, team here at Stanford. And Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Wong, and I'm a diabetes psychologist at Stanford University. And Rayhan. Hi there, guys. I'm Rayhan. I've had type 1 for 30 years. I'm an adult and pediatric endocrinologist at Stanford. And also in California, Jay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jay Shubrook, a primary care diabetologist at Torrey University, California. And Kelly. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Close, and I'm a patient representative. Lucky enough to get to serve on this panel. I'm editor of Dietribe.org as well. And down to Florida, Eleni. Hi, I'm Eleni Sheehan. I'm a family nurse practitioner and diabetes educator at the University of Florida. And also in Florida, Ashby. Hi hey everyone, my name is Ashby Walker and I'm a medical sociologist here at the University of Florida and I'm the director for the ECHO Diabetes Program for the state of Florida. And back west in the early morning, Dan. Uh, good morning, I'm Dan Saltman. I'm a primary care internist uh, and associate clinical professor at the University of Hawaii. And to Iowa, Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Falbo. I'm a physician assistant. I work at the Siouxland Community Health Center in Sioux City, Iowa, and help lead our Endo Echo with the University of Nebraska and Dr. Island. And to Maine, Erwin. Hi, I'm Erwin Brodsky. I'm an adult endocrinologist with um, the Endocrinology and Diabetes Center at Maine Medical Center and an adjunct scientist with the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. And uh, Massachusetts, Samar. Hey everyone, I'm Samar. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the Johnson Diabetes Center here in Boston. And to Nebraska, Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Island. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. And to New Jersey, Mary. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Bridgman. I'm an internal medicine clinical pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and a clinical professor at the School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University. And to the Echo Institute in New Mexico, Matt. Hey, Matt Bishamville. I'm an adult endocrinologist here at the University of New Mexico. Hello. And New York, Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Desimone. I'm an adult endocrinologist at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. And to Washington State, Savita. I am Savita Subramanian, and I'm an adult endocrinologist here at the University of Washington. And to Washington, D.C., Nicole. Hello, yes, I'm Nicole Earhart. I'm an adult endocrinologist and the lead for Project ECHO for diabetes in the D.C. community. Hello. Great. And then also in the DC area, I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker for today, Dr. John Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy is president of AMJA Foundation and chief medical officer at AMJA. Dr. Kennedy previously served as division director of endocrinology at Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania, 
where he led clinical education, research, and quality program development and expansion for the health system. Prior to his role at Geisinger, uh, Dr. Kennedy served as a managing partner at Diabetes and Endocrinology Associates in Hamilton, New Jersey. There he transitioned the hospital-owned group into a four-physician specialty private practice. Dr. Kennedy is board certified in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. He received his doctor of medicine degree from Jefferson Medical College, now the Sidney Camille Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He performed his internal uh, medicine residency at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia and his fellowship in diabetes, endocrinology, and metabolism at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center and Beth Israel Deacons Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Kennedy graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, thank you so much uh, for joining, and we're going to transition um, to your slides. Okay, well, thank you, Nick, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to address the ECHO Diabetes Program on the topic of identifying high-risk diabetes patients uh, for COVID-19 triage. So I have no financial uh, relationships with any uh, commercial interests related to the content of this presentation as a full-time employee of AMGA. So the learning objectives for today will be uh, to help recognize which patients with diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes for this talk, may be at increased risk for complications from COVID-19. And then to also look at how you can assess your current patient population for patients with uncontrolled diabetes at increased risk for complications from COVID-19. And then some real practical uh, tips and strategies that you can employ to help improve care for high-risk patients with type 2 diabetes and their complications. So with that, let's launch right into the first objective and see how is it that we came to understand the, the high-risk nature of a diabetes in COVID-19? Well, the first clue really came uh, from this series that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in March, uh, in which uh, a case series out of Seattle uh, looking at just 24 patients in nine Seattle area hospitals, identifying those patients that required ICU admissions due to the virus, it became clear that this was an older population with a mean age of 64, uh, predominantly male population with 63% male. Uh, and what we thought was the hallmark of the disease, fever, occurred in 50% of the patients yet diabetes was seen in 58% of the very small series. So that was the first clue that something was going on here. Uh, this was largely confirmed uh, by publication of the ACT-1 study, uh, Remdesivir for the Treatment of COVID-19 Preliminary Report of uh, Dr. Fauci fame. Uh, and here, even uh, as the numbers got larger with 1,000 patients enrolled, Again, we saw this metabolic predominance in the patients that were suffering from uh, hospitalization due to COVID-19, with 50% of the patients having hypertension, 37% having obesity, and a full 30% uh, of these patients having type 2 diabetes. Now, more than half of the patients had two or more chronic conditions, uh, which um, was further confirmed uh, when we went and we looked at the Northwell experience in New York City. And uh, now we're up to 5,700 patients in a series uh, to see if, if these preliminary findings really hold up. And the answer is they did. Uh, again, you see the older age group, um, only 40% female. And again, the predominance of hypertension, obesity, and more than 30% of patients in this large series uh, with diabetes presenting in the hospital in the New York City cohort. Now, unless you think this is only an American phenomenon, uh, in China, um, they retrospectively reviewed more than 7,000 cases. Uh, and here they saw that the diabetes status increased the need for medical in interventions uh, during their COVID-19 outbreak in China. 
Uh, also, diabetes status increased the mortality risk of patients. However, here is some good news that well-controlled blood glucose correlated with improved outcomes in infected patients. So what's going on here? I, I think uh, the pivotal link here between uh, type 2 diabetes and COVID infection uh, may be related to the renin-angiotensin system. Now, these ACE2 uh, receptors uh, are enzymes that are expressed uh, throughout uh, the body, predominantly on the heart, the blood vessels, the gut, and of course in the lung, in these type 2 pneumocytes and macrophages, as well as other tissues. Now, these ACE2 receptors uh, function as a binding site for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and that causes the virus to get incorporated into these cells. Uh, taking those uh, enzymes out of commission so that they're not able to do their regular job, uh, which is to help reduce uh, the angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 effect on the angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor. So if you don't have enough of these uh, ACE2 uh, enzymes around, what you can end up with is excess acute lung injury, acute uh, adverse myocardial remodeling, vasoconstriction and vascular permeability. So we're now seeing a link between uh, vascular dysfunction and the COVID virus and how it can uh, get in and, and do the damage. So in fact, the patients that you're most concerned about to be at risk with COVID-19 are those patients that we all recognize as having advanced complications of the metabolic syndrome. So the risk factors that we saw in these studies of hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes, liver function elevations, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, also correlate uh, very well with patients that are at risk of microvascular complications, uh, retinopathy, nephropathy, or peripheral neuropathy, and most closely with macrovascular complications in people with type 2 diabetes, either cardiovascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. And it, it just so happens that uh, AMGA has been uh, involved in a, a study in which we were uh, looking at a, a collaboration of patients involved in our what we call our Together to Goal campaign. Now, this is where we bring medical groups together from around the country uh, to work on common chronic conditions of patients with type 2 diabetes. And we had a specific track, which we called our innovator track, and here I'd like to acknowledge funding for this innovator track from Beringer Ingerheim Lilly, uh, our corporate collaborator. And we took uh, two different cohorts. One was patients with cardiovascular disease, and the other was a cohort of patients uh, with type 2 diabetes and eye complications. And we wanted to see, well, what were the best practices that we could help improve outcomes in, in these two cohorts of patients? This work was already underway and largely completed before COVID-19 hit, but the timing is such that I think we can learn lessons from this that we can apply to our patients that have comorbid conditions. And so who participated in this? Well, let's start with the microvascular cohort uh, eye care complications. Here you can see we selected a group of 10 uh, medical systems from around the country. You'll see some large integrated delivery networks like Geisinger and Henry Ford, and then you'll see some of our fiercely independent groups like uh, uh, Baton Rouge Clinic or Coastal Carolina Healthcare. So we have people from North, South, East and West and the Midwest in this. So it's a nice uh, cross section and hopefully uh, you'll see a group that looks a lot like yours. So all of these groups that were participating in this cohort were already reporting on a core bundle of diabetes measures. Hemoglobin A1C control, blood pressure control, lipid management, medical attention to nephropathy, and a bundle of four out of four of those measures within compliance. And they were sharing best practices and learning from each other uh, with quarterly data reports and regular meetings and webinars just like this. So added on top of this, uh, by being in this innovator track, they also agreed uh, to have an eye care measure. And here they took the patients that were in their together to goal uh, type two diabetes denominator, which was essentially adult patients that were active in their practice 
either in primary care, endocrinology, nephrology, or cardiology. That's their denominator. And then the numerator was measured by the HEDIS 2018 technical specifications for physician measurement, comprehensive adult diabetes care. Basically those patients that had documented screening uh, for retinal disease of diabetes in patients with type two diabetes within the measurement period. And so when we look across the cohort, what you're looking at each vertical column here is one of our medical groups. And then the blue bars represent the prevalence of type two diabetes at baseline. So you're looking at groups that had anywhere from 11% to as much as 24% of type two diabetes uh, in their population uh, or for an average of 16.4%. So very prevalent in these uh, groups that are participating. And here's a, a very quick summary of some of the results. You can see that at baseline in Q2 2018, only 46% of the patients had documented screening in this cohort. And uh, through the efforts of a one-year collaborative, this was able to increase to 52%. Now, what's interesting about this is much like the COVID epidemic, we're also experiencing a much slower diabetes epidemic. And the denominator actually grew by over 8,000 patients in this cohort just from new diagnoses coming into uh, the clinic over the course of that one year period. So to increase your percentage while your denominator is growing is, is very impressive. Now overall, this represented a 5% improvement absolute or 11% improvement relative to baseline. Eight out of the 10 groups saw improvement and four of the groups improved with more than 1,000 additional patients screened. So looking at the collaborative over time, there were an additional 8,600 additional patients screened in the cohort, or what we like to refer to as 17,200 eyeballs saved. And this was a rallying cry uh, for our folks and a lot of our clinics throughout. Whenever they closed a care gap on their eye care cohort, they thought about it as eyeballs saved. So what did they do? So very practical um, closed the loop uh, training occurred for the diabetes screening eye exam. We really found that this is one of the most important issues when it comes to either foot exams or eye exams is the documentation. And you really have to follow this logic. So was a screening eye exam completed? If it was completed, was the report documented? If the report was documented, do you know if it was normal or abnormal? If it was abnormal, did the patient receive a referral to the eye care specialist? And if they referred, did they complete the visit? And then you go around the loop again. If the visit was completed, was the specialist report documented? What we found is that approximately half of the care gaps in our patients with eye exams, the patient had actually completed the eye exam, but the report was not available to the physician to document in the record. And that by really focusing on this area, they were able to reduce the amount of um, non-compliant uh, eye exam reports documented to really just identify that much smaller group of patients that actually required uh, an updated eye exam. So what else was, was really helpful? Well, believe it or not, actually educating the staff and the patients on eye complications of diabetes is still really important. Uh, everybody learns this in medical school, but in a busy primary care practice or a cardiology practice or a nephrology practice, this may not be top of mind. And so going back and really focusing on staff education to understand that eye complications of diabetes are common and that it's uh, the number one cause of preventable blindness went a long way to making this top of mind. Also incorporating best practice alerts into the electronic health record uh, for diabetes eye exams. Um, some groups really enjoyed uh, having a celebration out there and a, a quick win for an award if they were able to document over 100 overdue eye exams that were completed for care gap closures on patients. And having that staff celebration for that quick win uh, really energized them to do more. And then engaging the clinic staff in pre-visit diabetes huddles, knowing ahead of time before your day starts which patients are due for an eye exam and indicating that 
on the daily schedule so that the physician focuses on that and orders that before the patient leaves the office. Now, some of our groups went the extra step and installed retinal cameras in the primary care clinics. They were able to train their staff to take the pictures uh, of the retina and then send these electronically to an eye care specialist for a reading and close the loop that way. This was a great improvement for the patients who really appreciated not having to have a separate appointment uh, for their diabetes eye exam and complete it right in their primary care office. A much simpler way that came out of the Baton Rouge Clinic was simply to develop a diabetes eye exam fax back form. And they went around to uh, all of their regional optometrists and ophthalmologists who they knew were in their referral network. And then they went to the State Optometry Society and they shared this fax form with them. And I said, please send us the results back to our clinic on this fax form so we can document. And that was a very effective small group solution that led to a marked improvement uh, in their uh, diabetes uh, eye completion and documentation rates. And then I think transparent reports. This is always very helpful to have a friendly competition among the providers themselves. Having transparent reports for providers so that they can compare within their own clinics and then as in our collaborative, you can compare to other high performing health systems around the country uh, to strive to do better. So next I wanna shift gears and talk a little bit about our CVD innovator track. Here are the groups that participated in this innovator track. Again, you see some larger groups like Mercy and some smaller groups like uh, Premier in Pennsylvania or Hattiesburg uh, in Mississippi. And again, you have groups from north, south, east, and west uh, that are kind of mixed in this that all share and learn from each other. And so let me take a minute to orient you to this data report. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, you see a summary of all of the groups combined into one bar. There were 190,000 patients in this cohort, patients with type two uh, diabetes in these 10 groups. And in the red bar, you see that 26% of those patients had a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The individual vertical bars going across the chart then show the, each of the um, same data for individual groups. And at the top, you can see this group had 40,000 patients enrolled, and this was a smaller group that had uh, only a few thousand patients enrolled. But on average, 26% of patients with cardiovascular disease, uh, and that's something that was very eye-opening to a number of the groups to recognize that, that one in four of their patients needed this attention. And so here the groups were asked to uh, follow a number of different measures. Uh, one was tobacco-free status, uh, also uh, aspirin for either primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And then additional with patients that had already established disease, secondary prevention with any statin treatment, high intensity statin treatment, and to achieve an LDL goal of less than 70. And you can see that there were some high baseline performance rates in several of these measures and some lower baseline performance rates in others. And over the course of the year, these small changes led to improvement in a number of patient lives. So again, you could see because of the high denominator, more than 1,700 new patients were tobacco free at the end of this collaborative and another 1,900 were moved onto a high intensity statin therapy for secondary prevention. So you can see how even small changes in metrics in a large population can help thousands and thousands of lives. So what worked? Well, uh, for this case, I thought we'd do a little bit of a countdown. So you know, the top five most effective interventions from the cardiovascular cohort of the innovator track. Number, one, number five, uh, leveraging the electronic health record to identify at-risk patients. And there were a variety of interventions that were used here. So uh, people developed best practice alerts. Uh, other teams developed diabetes order sets. Some developed smart phrases. But leveraging the electronic health record to identify your at-risk patients was one of the top interventions. Number four, integrating the pharmacy team into the diabetes cardiovascular disease efforts. This was very important to have engaged pharmacists uh, on the team because of the complexity of the diabetes uh, medication landscape. 
So some of these uh, pharmacists would be doing med uh, reconciliation and working on polypharmacy. Others were uh, functioning as certified diabetes educators or advanced uh, diabetes specialists, and they were doing dose titration according to uh, algorithms. And uh, many were involved in uh, statin education uh, to help identify patients that may have had an adverse reaction or experience on a, a previous statin and to help them uh, tolerate either low dose statin therapy or uh, have a retrial on uh, higher dose medication in the future. So this was very important to integrate the pharmacy team into the diabetes outcome. Number three, transparent data reports. Again, bringing this up, this was really important and it all starts with a registry of your diabetes patients at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and then within that, uh, area, identify those patients who could be a list of high intensity statin candidates. And then providing those type of unblinded provider uh, reports with evidence-based cardiovascular outcome trials guiding the algorithm and sharing that with the providers. So transparent data reports and a solid registry were key. The number two most popular intervention was actually provider education. And here the focus was strongly on the link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, so uh, what we found is that a number of our providers that had not been recently trained were focused on glycemia exclusively and um, avoidance of hypoglycemia, which are important goals. Uh, but to bring in the link with diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease uh, and to update them on all the recent studies that have been occurring, that became very important. And the key was to do that using cardiovascular disease risk reduction guidelines, such as you can find from the American Diabetes Association. And here, the focus was on this area in terms of our provider education, the area with patients that have uncontrolled diabetes despite diet and exercise and lifestyle intervention, despite metformin, and have a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or risk factors. This was the area that the providers needed the most education on, and many were very comfortable working on the other end of the algorithm, where cost is a major driver in hypoglycemia, but had not gained significant experience with the newer classes of medications that may help improve cardiovascular outcomes. And once that education sunk in and people began to have some experience, then they became more comfortable with this over a short period of time. Now, the number one effective intervention uh, that the majority of the groups used and made the biggest difference in their conversations with patients was to have the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk calculator embedded within their workflow at the point of care with the patient, ideally within the electronic health record if possible. Uh, this made a major difference because it allowed for a face-to-face -face conversation with the patient and help translate the risk into a number that they could understand. And then you can have that shared decision-making to decide which intervention you wanna work on at that particular visit. And so how did different groups do this? Well, uh, one group decided to focus on the cardiology department. So it, it ended up their primary doctors were using this risk calculator routinely, but the cardiologists were focused on the heart, not necessarily the relationship between the diabetes and the heart. And so by implementing this risk calculator into the regular clinic of cardiology, they were then able to bring in a whole nother department to help primary care, to help endocrinology in terms of getting patients on appropriate statin therapy. Um, another uh, group actually developed a cardiovascular risk reduction committee. And so here they had representatives from cardiology, endocrinology, internal medicine, and clinic operations and they met monthly to really drive systematic change across their organization with the underlying focus being on CVD risk reduction. A third group developed a clinical study, a real world clinical study, and they, uh, they had an electronic health record where they could tell who was using their embedded risk calculator and who wasn't. And so what they did is they simply looked at the uh, folks that had actually been accessing and clicking on and utilizing the embedded risk calculator and compared those to their providers who did not. And what they found was a statistically significant difference in the evidence-based statin prescribing 
favoring those physicians who did utilize the ASCVD risk calculator. And then they were able to share this among the rest of their group. And when the other doctors saw this, they said, oh, wow, this, this must be a good idea. And then they would, they would give it a try and get on board. Um, and then uh, another one of our small groups just decided to make this front and center for everybody. And uh, they added the risk score uh, to their patient registries. They created best practice alerts for their high-risk patients. They even put it on their provider's daily schedule. So if their patient had a high score, they you know, put a highlight with that score right on the schedule so that the uh, physician really uh, could not miss it at the time of that visit and would address it. And then they utilized their uh, case managers to close those care gaps uh, and to get patients into the appropriate uh, referrals. So other ideas that people use uh, to really drive outcomes, uh, a number of folks had some uh, good success using uh, apps such as the Quitters app for smoking cessation. They reached out directly uh, to patients via phone or text outreach to refer to smoking cessation programs. Um, they made sure that they had med reconciliation, even of non-prescription medications at every visit, including uh, aspirin if that was appropriate, and not just focusing on their prescription medications. And then uh, one of our smaller groups just put up visual cue posters in the waiting in the exam rooms, which were patient facing, so that the patient would see this and then they would ask their doctor, hey, you know, what's this thing about diabetes in my heart? How are they related? Can you talk to me about that? And that actually helped to stimulate the conversation. Um, another one of our groups put in a monthly hot topic newsletter uh, on diabetes and CVD and rotated the topics from statins to aspirin to hypertension to glycemic control on a monthly basis to keep this uh, relevant. And then uh, one of the really very successful interventions from a small group was identified their patients with diabetes and CVD that were already on statin therapy. And the only thing they did is they had the one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to move them up to high-dose statin therapy because the patients were already getting the prescription and all they needed to do was get on the evidence-based dose. So these and other resources are available uh, to folks by looking at our uh, Together uh, to Goal uh, campaign website. And so we have an entire toolkit of ideas that folks have learned organized into 11 different planks and uh, three different domains. So maybe your group is interested in empowering patients and you want to learn how to build an accountable care team. Well, there's a simple guide you can download to do that. Maybe you're ready to improve care delivery and you want to know how to adopt the treatment algorithm. Uh, well, there's help on how to do that from other groups that have been successful. Or maybe you're ready to leverage your information technology and publish these transparent internal reports. How do you do that while maintaining buy-in from your physicians? Well, you can go to the together to goal website and uh, you can see all these resources. Uh, we have a whole uh, link to COVID-19 resources. Uh, through our national partners. Uh, we have, uh, you can review the Together to Gold data, download the campaign toolkit, uh, connect with individual Plank mentors that are willing to talk to you about their success, and read our innovator track case studies to learn more. So I hope that uh, this was a helpful overview for everybody and that you now feel that you understand which patients are at risk how to identify those patients in your population, and some quick tips and tricks and tools that you can use to improve outcomes in your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, for uh, sharing that uh, presentation with us. That was excellent. Um, and we've had some great um, uh, questions come in during your presentation. I'm gonna ask um, our faculty to um, also share some of the questions that have come in. And uh, in the interim, if other uh, learners have any questions uh, for Dr. Kennedy, please go ahead and, and type them in the, the chat box um, and we can either answer them uh, via t uh, text uh, or live um, through discussion. So once again, uh, thanks again and I'll uh, open it up to questions. So there was a question that came in in terms of um, workflow um, and FQHCs and having retinal um, 
scanners within the, the clinic and, and embedding it in workflow. Um, Dr. Kenny, I don't know if you have any additional kind of feedback on kind of uh, barriers to, to coming over that or any feedback you got from, from members on, on having the retinol um, uh, in the clinic? Yeah, so uh, it's very important to address the clinic workflow and one size does not fit all. Um, we started with just two sites, one primary care site and, uh, and one specialty site uh, when we implemented this at the Geisinger Health System and the workflows were completely different. Uh, so uh, doing the, um, working with the local clinic to find where this fits best is very important. Um, in the endocrine clinic, they found that it made sense uh, to do it during the triage process when they were getting a, a blood a glucose reading and the vital signs, and they were able to train the staff up front to do it at that point. Um, and then the, uh, the readings uh, were sent electronically uh, over to an ophthalmologist uh, for a final report. In primary care, the workflow was completely different. That was very disruptive to do it up front uh, to their check-in process. And so they would, um, they had a special room in the back where the camera was stored that didn't have a window in it. And the patient would be referred uh, over to that uh, at the end of the visit before they left. So uh, workflow issues are very unique to each clinic and it's important to uh, work with the nurse uh, manager and the staff as to what works best in your clinic. Great, thank you. Any other uh, questions any of the faculty want to share? Uh, yes, this is Dan Saltman. Um, as a primary care internist, I was wondering what your use of uh, standing orders would be so that the, uh, the kind of administrative burden of having uh, the primary care provider trigger the or order for the same thing over and over and over again for routine activities like screening, did people use standing orders uh, in order to, uh, there's been studies that have shown that improves the having nurses and, and non-providers non do that, those kinds of routine things can in, increase the percentage of uh, patients that get screened that way. Was there a use of standing orders in your groups? Uh Yes, and I, I can speak also from my personal experience at, at Geisinger, where uh, they've developed a, a diabetes huddle, uh, which essentially will look at the list of patients that are coming in ahead of time, uh, and they'll identify the care gaps uh, on those patients. And then they'll have standing orders, and it depends on your clinic, but sometimes those are just pre-populated for the physician to sign off on at the time of the visit. Uh, other times, depending on your collaborative agreement, they can be ordered ahead of time uh, so that the patient has them completed and the results are available to the physician at the time of visit. Very important uh, to take the work that can be done by other providers and let them work at the top of their license in your state and then let the physician uh, really focus uh, on, well, three main areas, blood pressure, number one, <laughs> lipids, number two, and diabetes control, number three. Uh, and that'll take up most of the physician's time just focusing on those three areas. Thank you so much. And if um, um, uh, learners have additional questions, please go ahead and, and type into the chat box um, um, as we move on to our, our next um, part of this um, session. And also there, there have been some other uh, excellent questions coming in in the, the question box, uh, not um, directly related to the didactic, but on ACE inhibitors um, and also um, um, dexamethasone use, uh, which I think we'll, uh, Rehan, if you wanna reply a little bit to give a, a summary, but I think what we'll do is for next week, we'll add in a pre-submitted question and, and talk a little bit more um, on steroid uh, stress-induced hyperglycemia management and um, in diabetes. Um, Rehan, do you wanna kind of share what you shared with the group in the response? I, I was just saying that, you know, in many cases, steroids can induce a very acute change in insulin resistance, which have, may have a variable duration. So for ICU patients especially, 
um, these moment-to-moment -moment changes, especially when paired with pressors, for example, may only be uh, best dealt with with an insulin drip. Um, one can try with subcutaneous insulin, but then you run the risk of having overcompensation for insulin resistance factors, and then suddenly those factors are removed and someone might become very insulin sensitive. So for the best moment to moment control, an insulin drip may be of great value. Thank you. And then we had one question that um, Kelly was trying to submit. Um, Kelly, do you want to um, just speak up audio? Oh, yeah. Thank you. What an amazing, what just an amazing presentation and so much learning, I'm sure, for patients. The patients are so lucky who have been in there. I was wondering if you could say anything about the retinal camera and any tips on that, because it's such a fear for patients to go to this and then they want the answer right away. And how do you maximize the getting the feedback back to them quickly about what they need to do? Sure. So the Thank cameras you. that were utilized were, uh, were non-dilating uh, retinal cameras, and there's a variety of them that are out there. So it's nice uh, from a patient standpoint because they don't have to go through the dilating eye and the blurry vision. Um, there is some technical challenge, though, and um, so if the patient uh, does not have large pupils, uh, you might get a non-readable uh, exam. Uh, or if the patient um, has a cataract, uh, it can be very difficult on these cameras to get any sort of a reading. Or even if they have a certain neurologic condition in which they, they might have shaking or moving, you can get it sort of a blurrogram. So about 15% of the images we found could not be done um, in a typical clinic, and those patients would require an ophthalmologist or an optometrist for follow-up. But for the other 85% of the patients, it was very well received. Um, it's completely painless. And uh, once they had been through it, uh, they were very happy to have it done and not need to make that extra trip, uh, particularly for a normal exam. Uh, they were also very grateful if they were found to have an abnormal exam, and then they knew that that was a priority uh, in order to follow up. So we found very good patient acceptance from it, although you do have that 10 to 15% unreadable that just needs to see an eye care specialist. Thank you, so just making sure to communicate with them, yeah, as well as possible, that's great. Again. And so the, the question that came in was, how can we prepare for the challenges facing our patients with diabetes, having limited access to medications and health care related to job loss? How should emergency food supply and nutrition need to be met when usual food access points do not exist, such as school meal programs and senior center meal plans? We appreciate this question so much because it's such an important question right now. And so just quickly for the sake of time, um, I walk through some resources that we'll make available on the website. As always, this PowerPoint will be uh, available to the participants today. So if you um, want to address issues of food insecurity and economic distress with your patients, which is so important, one of the things to understand from the outset is that there's no one face of hunger. And so right now we don't know who needs assistance. So the best practice is to put into place a screening tool for all of your patients um, at your centers, which will screen for food insecurity. And the most widely used and validated scale is just a two item scale. It's just two questions and it's the hunger vital sign scale. And by patients answering these two questions that will give you an indication as a provider if they are at risk for food insecurity. We have developed um, at the University of Florida and at Stanford resource guides for communities living with diabetes in COVID-19. And so these resource guides compile information for your patients about resources related to uh, diabetes supplies, hunger assistance programs, and other types of resources at the national level, and some are more specific to local uh, communities. 
So we will make these templates available for everyone uh, for use. We have them um, translated into Spanish and English for the state of Florida, and we're happy to provide that template so you could adjust that for your uh, patient population where you are uh, watching from. We would encourage you to refer patients um, to food assistance programs, um, to programs that are available now as Nick referenced for insulin assistance and also uh, diabetes related supplies. I have links on these slides to many of the national uh, databases where you can go search for some of these uh, resources in your community. And if we go to the next slide, one of the resources that I would call your attention to is a platform called NowPow. And so right now, NowPow is available for healthcare providers in 14 different states. This is an amazing platform for you as providers to be able to connect your patients to hundreds of different social support services in different areas. And so you can literally geocode to blocks from your patient's home address of places where they can go to find help with um, food banks, where they could go find free yoga classes, uh, where they can get assistance of all different types. So I would strongly encourage you to check out NowPow if you're in one of the states where NowPow is available. And I also will call attention to an upcoming uh, webinar that's free that's being offered by the American Diabetes Association on July 9th. And the link to register for this webinar is here, but it's specifically addressing uh, diabetes and food insecurity. And this is uh, really designed not only for healthcare providers, but community health workers. So this will be a really great uh, webinar and resource to share both um, with your own staff and also your communities, because it will offer a lot of information about addressing food insecurity.